I'm going to try um, just projecting. The room's not that full. I've seen other people not need to use the mic. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's definitely better than trailing a, a cable along the stage. So um, thank you for coming. My name is Victoria. I'm going to talk to you about limiting work in progress and if it's important, why it's important. It's going to be an interactive session. So I know it's a little bit darker down there, but you, we, I'm going to hope that you're going to turn around and talk to each other as we go through this. Um, I am head of delivery for our internal products at Financial Times. That means I've got teams who build uh, products and systems that people use within the organization. So not on the website, but many other things that we have inside. So um, along uh, throughout the years while I've been working there, one of the things that we do talk about is various agile things like limiting work in progress. People talk about it a lot. As we go into this, this is what the session's going to look like. So we're going to have an enactment for which I'm going to be looking for two volunteers. So two of you will, um, will be hopefully jumping up here to come and help me out with that. So have a think at the moment. I resist from volunteering for just a few seconds while I tell you the rest of it. So once we have our enactment, we're then going to discuss what we observe during that from five different perspectives. And then we'll, we'll wrap up and people will be moving on to the last sessions of the day. So with that, I need two volunteers. Who would like to come and help me? Thank you. We've got one there. One more. Brilliant. Up you come. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for everyone. Two volunteers who do not yet know what they're volunteering for. So very brave of you. Thank you. So, um, so uh, what are your names? Hello, what are your names? Uh, my name's Claire Ashcroft. We've got Claire and we've got... I'm Nitin Shah. Nitin. Well, Claire and Nitin. Thank you, Claire and Nitin. I'm going to give you a piece of paper so you do find out what it is that you volunteered for. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to allow you to um, read these um, just while I talk for another couple of minutes and decide whether you're still happy with what you've been given to do. <laughs> so, while they're reading, when we talk about limiting work in progress, it's often discussed in terms of context switching. We all know, we've heard many times that context switching is a bad thing because it takes up lots of time, but so who would, you know, who's got thoughts on, on why that is? What is it about context switching that's, that's really bad? It gives you a while to get back to, uh, back to what you were previously working on. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There's a very interesting talk this morning that was showing how, um, I think it was a keynote actually, that was fixing the wrong problem. It was yeah. hiding the symptom. It didn't make that much of a difference. Uh -huh. It actually was hiding the organization with them behind why you're not doing it. Yeah, that's a deep one, but yeah. And what are you going to say? It's even worse when someone is actually working, working on that while you were doing something else. You come back and you are in the middle of work. Yeah, exactly. And one more. It's slightly not discussed, but in, in the team. Exactly. So there's several things there, but in terms of context switching, that time loss is often that bit. I've started several things. The time to decide which thing you're getting back into, find your exact spot, possibly rereading the previous paragraph, all of that, it all takes up an awful lot of time. So time is an element. But other than time, what, what I want to find out today is whether there's anything else other than time that, it, that is a factor when deciding about limiting your work in progress. Before saying that our two volunteers are going to show you, I'm just going to ask them, are you still happy with what you're yes, doing? That's fine. Yeah, are you happy? Fantastic. Thank you very much. So rather than me just droning on for 45 minutes, we're going to start with the, our two fabulous volunteers who are going to show you. So step this way, Claire. Five. So which one are you? You are the... Yeah. Okay. So... Knitting yep. thinks that the best way to get your work done is to do it one piece at a time. Yes. Just do a thing, <laughs> do something, finish it, move on, and do something else. And I think there's, there's what, five pieces of work? But I think we're going to go with five. Okay. We'll go with five pieces of work, and Knitting is going to do and he's going to do them one at a time, because that's what he thinks is the best way to do things. <laughs> Whereas Claire doesn't believe all this stuff about context fiction, thinks it's all a myth, and thinks that actually the sooner that you start something, the sooner you finish it. So she's just going to get on with it, really. And, and, and um, why mess around? So I'm going to invite our two volunteers to just get to work. And so get stuck in, get working. And we're just going <laughs> to... 
<laughs> we're just going to see what we notice. And, um, and um, there might be a number of things to observe here around. Um, I'll let you make your own observations. We're going to talk about them in detail. But Claire, you look like you're loving that. <laughs> So Claire might have bitten off more than she can chew with that one. Um, but we'll see. How are you doing there, Nitin? That's, 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 that's all right. Yeah, yeah. It looks very calm. And, yeah. yeah. Claire is doing her very best. I think, are we, are we, are we, I think you've reached capacity. You've reached capacity. I think Claire has reached capacity. Um, and I'm going to suggest that Claire and Nitin take a seat, go and get a drink of water. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for our two volunteers. Thank you. So while they're recovering, I hope you've got a drink of water. Have you got a drink of water? You got water? Yeah. yeah. So while they wash that down and recover, um, let's just, we'll come back to them in a moment. Um, there's, as I say, there's five different aspects we're going to look at this from. The first one is time. So what did we notice uh, time-wise? I mean, was there any sense of who was going to finish first or? Anything like that? What did anyone notice? <laughs> it might have been Claire, but she was struggling a bit. I, usually, I don't always finish it, stop it before we finish, to be honest. Um, it's the time, what we often find is sometimes one will finish faster and sometimes the other will finish faster, and it comes down to who enjoys eating marshmallows more, as with any task, who's better at it, who enjoys it more. Um, what we usually find is that actually, on average, they finish around the same time. So it's not just actually the whole time that we're talking about. Or what we're often talking about is the fact that um, Nitin finished, and, and in terms of time-wise, his first marshmallow didn't take very long, whereas for Claire, her first, first marshmallow was going to take as long as her last marshmallow. So does anybody know what, what, what law we're referring to there? Little's law. We're talking about Little's law. So essentially, if you are doing X number of things at once, however long it takes you to do one, you multiply it by X. And so he came up with this way of trying to optimize the flow of customers through his store. If you're looking at the average number of customers, it's equal to the average arrival rate multiplied by how long they spend at the, at the business. Um, Disney applied this very well in their organization, and it's then been taken and applied to Kanban. So if you then turn it into looking at work in progress, having those three factors means you can take any two in order to predict the third. So it gives you the ability to answer the question, how long is it going to take to eat a marshmallow? The answer is, depends how many marshmallows you're trying to eat at once. Um, and so that enables you to calculate some of that. If you want to know more about Little's Law, I'm not going to talk about it too much. Other people have done that a lot. David Lowe has done a great description um, using a car park. Um, a gold rat in the goal, uh, lots of stuff in there about the, the adding variability into the mix and what that can do to it. Um, and if you like metrics, then Daniel Vacanti rips this apart a little bit and Little's Floor, really interesting to read. Um, right, back to our volunteers. How did that feel? Claire, how are you? Was, are you okay? You're okay now. <laughs> you still got one. How, how did it feel while you were doing it? Did you? Yeah, a bit overwhelmed. I think we could see that you were a bit overwhelmed, but you felt a bit sick. That's not good. I'm glad you're all right now. Yeah. What about knitting? How was that? You were enjoying it. Fantastic. Brilliant. We're going to come back to that in more detail later, but that's really good to hear. Phew. Um, I want to know what else could be observed. So um, this is where I'm going to ask you to do a bit of discussion amongst yourselves, so talk to your neighbor. We're going to look at it now from complexity and risk. So think about complexity and risk, those two different scenarios, and what would the impact on this be? Um, according to whichever approach you took. So I'm going to give you three minutes. We'll come back to the room and we'll share whatever you come up with. I'll have a bit of a chat. I've got a couple of sub-questions just to help you go. But a couple of minutes chat and we'll come back. So talk to your neighbours a bit. Okay, so what have we got back? We'll come, we'll come back to the room. So who would like to share? What have you thought of with relation to complexity and risk?
Uh, right. OK. So there's other subsystems going on that might get clogged up. <laughs> Indeed. Yes, very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So it was actually just get all that stuff going on made it all a bit on. You couldn't. You couldn't know where to start to get involved well, if you would want to. to yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. 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 So they might not have been very well chewed, actually, because yeah, you could be reg regretting that later. <laughs> yeah. So there was. Is that if she wasn't able to finish the job, someone just had to come in and finish it for her? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't want to be that one, would you? No. Well, it's yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of ri yeah the ri um, in complexity, you know, anything else that could have gone wrong. Or shall we? Go on. I was just thinking that from a purely billing perspective, you imagine they could only fill the last hour on Tuesday. Yeah. If you shut on one, you can't go for anything. Absolutely. So it matched the whole job of the list there to make sure the list didn't want to have to Very true. Very true. Yeah. Right. So um, I'm going to go Blue Peter and see the ones I prepared earlier, which you've covered some of actually. So, yeah, go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some of these things we've got five different lenses that we're looking through it through. So some of these might come up a bit later on, but very very valid. <laughs> yeah. Go on. That's true. Yeah. Might be a different way. Uh, yes, that's true. An opportunity to uh, reflect on if the way of doing this work isn't working. The opportunity to realise that is, yeah. So, um, here's the thing. If, if, if they'd hiccuped, if something had gone, if there'd been a small problem for knitting, the problem was literally bite-sized. He could have just disposed of that one uh, marshmallow. We could have just dealt with the situation quite easily if... Claire had hiccuped. I think it would have been a lot more grisly. We'd all have been panicking. I'd have been trying to give you the Heimlich maneuver. <laughs> and, you know, we'd have been calling first. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we did have someone. No, I didn't have someone on call. Maybe we should have done. But, <laughs> but the point is, if, you, if your problem is small, if, you, if you're doing things in small pieces, if you have a small problem within the t uh, and, and as a team and you find it, what do you do? Who gets involved? The team, yeah. So you've got a small problem, you spotted it while it's small, you just get on and deal with it. If you have been building all of these things and you're doing it all at once and you're building up this bigger system and bigger system and you hit a problem where potentially you can't deliver this whole thing, who gets involved then? Yeah, oh, yeah exactly. Lots of management, <laughs> lots, everybody who's, who's put their neck on the line, lots of people want to get involved. You have lots of people who are trying to call lots of meetings to find out whose, not fault it is, because we don't do blame, but, you know, whose fault it is. Um, and the one thing they're not doing is, is fixing the problem. So trying to, having your problems small, because you're dealing with things in small pieces, reduces the risk and complexity of addressing that risk. Secondly, releasing. So Nitin had no problem swallowing his, releasing, dispatching his marshmallows. It was really quite simple, quite easy. Claire was making quite a meal out of that. They <laughs> were really getting quite bogged down in there. The releasing was not happening. Um, yeah, <laughs> quite a slow release process, yes. Um, you want to be biting, breaking down your problem into bite-sized pieces um, so that you can get through those. It takes me back through history of, of the FT when I think back to the bad old days of our monolithic architecture where everything is one code base. And so a change made to our metadata was in the same code base as our search field on our website. 
So, if you made, so you ended up with lots and lots of disparate changes that were made by lots of different people all being bundled up into releases that needed 15 people on site with five on standby in order to do these monthly releases, which could only happen when our entire digital organization was happy to not have the thing online. It was, uh, you know, it was complex. So we obviously needed to change that and go faster. We need to release faster than that. Um, has risks, so we break things down. So our microservices and highly modularized things now means we're releasing multiple times a day, tiny, tiny releases, which means not only that we're releasing more frequently, each release, because it's smaller, carries less risk, can be verified more easily. So those huge releases that were so unwieldy to do there was a 20% rollback rate on those because they were so complex. We now have a 0.01% rollback rate on any of our releases now because they're so tiny. So keep your problems small. Releasing is easier. You don't want to keep your tummies waiting. Knit in. Your tummy was kept happy. You, felt you, you gave your tummy some marshmallow nice and early. Claire's tummy was just getting hungrier. I, I'm sure it was. I'm sure it's exactly what's happening. What happens when you keep your customers waiting? They get hangry, they want more, and they'll say, if you're making me wait, then why don't you just do this other change while you're at it? And can you just do X, can you just do Y? So their big release that they're waiting for just gets bigger, and they're waiting for longer. So that cost of delay just grows. Um, Donald Reinertsen tells us that we need to try and quantify the cost of delay. He, he, he says, put it in a currency, because then people will, will understand it. I'm not sure we necessarily need to do that, that's not easy, but if you can at least articulate it and, 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 and specify that and understand those costs, it helps, make, it helps us to make those, those decisions a bit smarter. So the next one is back to you guys again. So now I'd like you to think about another couple of minutes of chat about feedback loops. Thinking again about those two scenarios. What was the difference between those and where are the sources of feedback that a team gets and, and where would they have existed in these scenarios. So another two or three minutes of chatting and then we'll come back to the room again. Okay. So should we come back? Brilliant. So some of you are in the, uh, the feedback session this morning, if, you, or if not others, just to know what the hand on the air is for. Um, so feedback, what have we got? What have people come up with? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's just what she said. Yes. So yep. With that, uh, the first one I felt realized that I'm eating slowly, and then immediately I don't know, I realized, and then the second one I, I was eating with my normal speed, which I could do, so that was exactly accurate. You did, you inspected and adapted, yeah. <laughs> yeah, anything else? Absolutely. Yep. Very good. <coughs> Anything else? Yeah. Might not even enjoy it. Yeah. Might not taste it. Yeah. Okay. So, what did I have? It's just the issue that gentleman there raised. So, does what, what if there'd been something weird and not quite right with that marshmallow? It could have been a fly, it could just be sugar. It could just a bit of burnt sugar. But if there'd been something odd going on there, Nitin was enjoying and savouring his marshmallow. He would have spotted very quickly if there was something wrong and, you know, he would have discarded one marshmallow. And so that waste would have been quite minimal. Would have taken Claire some time to notice as she was munching through all of that. She wouldn't have been able to find that, de that detail quite so quickly, and, um, and then that would have been quite a lot that was discarded, so much greater, wa greater waste um, and time. Yes. Um, so essentially, if, if, you know, if you're finding your problems early on while they're still small, then um, the, the addressing of those problems is clearly much simpler. And back to Reinertsen again, he talks about the economics, which are fairly straightforward. If you're making smaller changes, any problems, any debugging is clearly quicker, any resolution is very quicker. It just makes sense. So from, a, from that practical perspective. Um, 
well, what if the tummy rejected it? What if it actually had some kind of weird allergy? You know, there was some ingredient in there that just didn't react very well. You know, knitting might have felt a bit, oof, you know, but he'd have been all right. Or as Claire might have been quite poorly because the impact of that allergy would have been much stronger. So uh, you, want, you know, find, and get, find that feedback earlier while it's still small enough to relate to and, and deal, some, deal with quite easily. Um, sometimes it happens. Sometimes people don't like what we make for them. And, um, and we, want, we, we, want to, we want to hear early so that we can do something about it before it gets too big. Um, and then someone mentioned earlier about priorities shifting. What if, what if the feedback was that actually I wanted them to focus on the white marshmallows? So Nitin could have just finished the one he was eating and then he could have focused entirely on white marshmallows, whereas Claire would have had to finish everything that she had in progress before she could even think about moving on and, and, and switching her priorities. So, um, yes, so new information becomes available all the time, priorities change. The less we have to wrap up that's in, in progress before we can move on and adapt to that, the better. So the next one I want you to think about is measuring delivery. So what was being delivered? How could we measure that value that was being, being delivered? How long was it going to take? Um, what was predictable or what wasn't? So two or three minutes again, just have a chat, and then we'll feed back to the room again. OK, we're done? Have we got some thoughts? Who would like to share something um, from your discussion about measuring and delivery? Yes, yes. Anyone's guess. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about if you ask them to eat like eight marshmallows afterwards, she has no way of telling you how long that is going to take. Yeah. Whereas eating one at a time, she has some degree of predictability. Yes. So you were able to measure after the first one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's very often it's just sort of one to know exactly what they want. They might think they want five marshmallows, but they get three in the mouth, and yeah. then you just put them <coughs> the and then they'll be fine after the next one. Yes, exactly, exactly. So you're just saying about after the first one, you can start to predict. After the second one, you could then refine that prediction. You could be saying that you want to actually eat them slower the first time, the second one. So you That's true. So there's actually multiple opportunities to, 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 to check that. Yeah. Anything else? No? Okay, I blew Peter a moment again. Um, I think you've caught most of these. So, well, it was delivering value early. So, when you started eating those marshmallows, your stomach wanted marshmallows and it still wanted them by the time it had some delivered. Whereas, after some chewing away, I don't know if Claire's stomach still wanted them, but they were coming. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the relevance, you know, some of the context sometimes changes. Um, estimation, so this is one that was several of you said, you know, in terms of how big a job it is, you know, Nitin was able to tell us pretty quickly how long it was going to take him to, to eat one, whereas with Claire's it was anybody's guess. Claire thought she knew how much she could take on. I think she realised after a while that, that, was, that she'd overestimated somewhat what her capacity was. Um, Cone of uncertainty, people seen this? The time at which, the point at which you know how long it's going to take you to do something is after you've done it. <laughs> if you estimate at the beginning, you've got a huge variance. Um, knit in, we had the opportunity to assess as we went through. So it was a cone, whereas for Claire, it was actually just a black box until really, until right at the end, it was the only time at which we were going to reevaluate that. And then appetite, how much is enough? So, the gentleman there was saying, um, uh, Nitin had the opportunity to stop. You know, I've had enough, don't want to eat anymore. Um, I, the customer sometimes doesn't need everything. Or as, as Claire, well, you know, five marshmallows were on their way. <laughs> um, so creating the opportunity to not spend time doing stuff that's not wanted is really important. And, and, and so having a, making, you know, having a way of working that creates those opportunities. 
So the last thing, and it's last but not least, it's very important, it's what we touched on uh, at the beginning of this, is how does it feel to work in those two ways? What would be the experience? So um, what more could we say about uh, Nitin and Claire's experiences? I'm going to invite you to just go back for one last discussion together, um, and then we'll come back to the room and, and share our thoughts on that. Okay. Have we got stuff to share with the room? Are we done? So who's got something to share about the experience of working in one of these ways? I felt that Claire was really exposed. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So exposed is interesting. Yeah. yeah. So this idea is a lot of pressure in, and it sort of felt quite, yes, that's probably true. Yes. Satisfied at having accomplished something. Yeah. yeah. She did look very busy. <laughs> yeah, quite right. Yeah. Yes. John Clapham's talk yesterday. Yes. Anything different? So it could actually impact other people around her. You could radiate this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. So a happier relationship with the customer, actually. If they're happy, then you're happy. And yeah. That's really good. Uh, 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 yeah, good progress. Another thing is not just that the customer is unhappy. After a while, it starts to not trust you anymore. Yeah. Because mm. you are there so many. Yeah. Why you're not delivering? Yeah. You arrive all the time in the day. Yeah. And then it's difficult to go back and yeah. make something that actually you're working a lot. Yeah. So the experience of the customer and actually your relationship with the customer just deteriorate. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't feel good for anyone. <laughs> yeah, you were very visible in your in your in your apprehension. It seems, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's not great for your morale, even. Exactly. Absolutely. So that comes back to the point at the beginning about being exposed. You know, that bit that quite isolated, actually. Yeah. So there's a lot around this one, actually, you know, out of all the different aspects we've looked at. So this is, you know, this is why it's last, but it's not least. It's actually the, the most, in, in some ways, the most significant. So it was mentioned the sense of achievement from just getting things done. So Nitin accomplished things. Each, each marshmallow, I've done something, I'll move on. Whereas Claire just wasn't getting any sense of achievement. She was just you know, getting increasingly stressed and anxious you know, as, as, as these things just weren't moving on. And it is, it's really motivating and a great morale boost every time you move on from something else. I've accomplished something, I've made someone happy, next. And it's, re it's, it's, it's very rewarding. It's so much less stressful. So Nitin was in control of his own pace. He could take on another marshmallow as and when he felt able to and uh, as opposed to just being overwhelmed by it all being pushed and piling on top um, at, 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 at a pace that just wasn't achievable and wasn't uh, driven by your own capacity. Um, and 
we just can't understate that you know it's say there's one enough um there's been a lot of research and thankfully a lot of talk these days about the impact of stress at work um and it's gone from and it is it is a, it is a fuzzy subject it is about feelings but you it very much a strong strong relationship between how people feel and their productivity which is possibly why it's being talked about quite so much because businesses are realis realizing you know this stuff actually matters it's not just about being nice to our staff it actually affects the bottom line um, and so when companies are starting to bring in happiness indexes how can we make people happier what they're trying to do is to remove those things that just make them stressed um, so that people can be their most creative and productive selves so the effects of stress are becoming increasingly understood. So it might start with the ability to, to focus on a task. If you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed by stuff, just, just focusing on a thing can become very difficult because it's all swimming around. And as that becomes difficult, as focusing on a task becomes difficult, then simply processing information, whether it's new information or whether it's existing information that's already stored in your head, to try and use that to solve problems, which is, even, you know, is, is a step up, and that becomes difficult. So you can't focus on tasks, you can't solve problems. So what does that mean to your ability to do your job well? So, you know, quality drops. So stress causes a drop in quality. It, drop, drop, it causes um, you to not be performing very well in your role. And so if you're in a team and you're stressed, you will start to feel that you're not contributing as much the team might think that you, start, you get more stressed and before you know it you start seeing some defensive behavior as people start feeling as if maybe you know those relationships aren't what they aren't what they could be they start to break down you get some clashes and then the inevitable next step is people actually becoming physically ill and being uh, and becoming absent and then beyond that you then get into John Clapham's great talk yesterday about um, burnout you know so stress we want to try and reduce that we don't want to overwhelm people with too much stuff at one time that causes them to feel that they're not in control of what they're doing and it's a, it's, it's a hugely significant part of limiting your work in progress we need sustainable working practices last but not least i think was actually got mentioned over there somewhere i can't remember where but what if actually there was a genuine need to consume marshmallows at a, at a rate that was faster than what knitting could do one at a time. So anyone could have jumped in and helped. I could have grabbed a marshmallow and helped out. Anybody here could have helped out. You're not going to want to do that with Claire's marshmallows. So much harder to, to, to jump in and organize yourselves around when the work is all in pieces and it's all half done and it's a bit of a mess and who really knows what's going on in there. You probably just don't want to touch it. So. Liv limiting your work in progress enables you to um, restructure or organize or do whatever you need to do to help get the work done better. And so as limited to it is one of the five Kanban principles, it's basically a buy one, get one free. If you limit your whip, then you find the opportunities and where you need to make changes to optimize the flow of work through your team. And that's my last point, actually. Um, other than to say, does limiting whip matter? What do we think? Does limiting whip matter out of all of that? Yes. Good. <laughs> because it wastes less time, reduces the complexity and the risk that surrounds complexity. It shortens those feedback loops. We deliver value faster and we can measure it. And finally, it reduces stress. And that's it. We're out of time. Thank you very much for all your contributions. We're getting stuck in.